Chapter 3.5, Symbolic Arguments. So in this chapter, we're finally going to take everything we've learned um, in making truth tables and understanding logical connectives, and we're going to start formulating arguments with it. Um, we're going to use reasoning in order to come to conclusions and figure out whether those conclusions make logical sense. Um, so first, what is a symbolic argument? A symbolic argument consists of a set of premises and a conclusion. It's called a symbolic argument because we generally write it in a symbolic form to determine its validity. So an argument is valid when its conclusion necessarily follows from a given set of premises. Um, an argument is invalid or a fallacy when the conclusion does not necessarily follow from those given pre uh, premises. So note that an argument does not need to be accurate to be valid. So I could make a completely, uh, a bunch of, uh, I could make up a bunch of lies, right? As long as logically my conclusion follows from those lies, it's still a valid argument. We just then need to talk about, well, the fact that everything I made up was false. But false in and of itself does not mean fallacious. Um, fallacious being a fallacy. So we are going to talk about, okay, we need to start with premises. Premises mean the facts of my argument. And then the conclusion is what, um, what I can draw from those facts. What can I get from them? Or at least what did I get from them? And then we're going to talk about, can I do that accurately? So there's a lot of different, um, types of arguments that can be made. The ones we're going to talk about here are going to be some ones with very specific names to them, but we will also see arguments where we won't necessarily know what they're called. Um, so first we're going to talk about the law of detachment, which is in Latin known as modus ponens. So uh, symbolically this argument is written as premise one is an if-then statement, if p then q. Premise two is affirming P. And then the conclusion, we say, therefore, Q. Note that this three dots right here um, is read as therefore. So this just means therefore. So that's a short form of saying therefore. Um, it's a way of marking our conclusion without having to state the word conclusion every time. So in my example, I have my if then statement. If it snows, then it is cold. So P is it snows and Q is then it is cold. Then my second premise is affirming that P is true. So then I say it is in fact snowing. So then my conclusion is therefore it must be cold. So this is an example of a valid argument, but we're going to show why it's a valid argument. You won't just know it offhand. So verbally, we can put all of this together as an argument, we can say if premise one and premise two, and if there's more premises, then and premise three and premise four, we just stick ands between them, then that uh, gives us our conclusion, right? Remember when I introduced the idea of the if then, I said we had our antecedent and our consequent, but I said there are other names for this. Sometimes the consequent, which is the Q part of the if, the, uh, if P then Q, um, can also be known as just the conclusion of the if-then statement. It's another word for it. So, um, in this case we're using that here, that we are making this entire argument into one big if-then statement. So if these things, then this. Okay? And to go with this example, that just means if we know that when it snows it's cold, and we know it is currently snowing, then we would know it must be cold. So this is a valid argument form. Okay, so that is the first and simplest of the valid argument forms that we're going to see. And we'll see other examples of valid arguments as well as invalid ones that are common. Um, so here I have, if you have enough reward points, then you get a free flight. You did not get a free flight. And the conclusion is, therefore, you did not have enough reward points. Okay, so if we want to determine whether or not this is a valid argument. First, 
we start by writing the argument in symbolic form. So I'm going to start by identifying what are P and Q in this example, or R or S or T or whatever letters we want to use and however many we need, but in this example we're only going to need two. So P will be you have enough reward points, and Q will be you get a free flight. So then notice that the next two statements all relate to those P and Q from the first one. So this, sorry, so the second premise is just you did not get a free flight, which would be the negation of Q. And then the conclusion is you did not have enough reward points, which is the negation of P. So in total we get the symbolic form P uh, implies Q, not Q, therefore not P. Okay, so we want to compare with forms that are known to be either valid or invalid. So right now we only know one form, so we can only compare to modus ponens. Um, is this modus ponens? Well, let's go back real quick. Here we have modus ponens. If P then Q, P therefore Q. So here we're taking the, um, the antecedent and then we conclude the consequent. Here we're taking the negation of the consequent and concluding the negation of the antecedent. So it's not the same thing. So this is not modus ponens. It's related, but it's not the same. So we can't use that. We can't just say it's automatically valid based on its form. Next, uh, if there are no known forms to compare it with, you or you do not remember the forms, we go on to the next step. So if the argument contains two premises, we write a conditional statement. If it, I should say if it contains two or more premises, though we're not often going to see uh, that many in this class. Um, so we take premise one and premise two implies the conclusion. Okay. So in this case, that means I'm just taking this and this implies this, like so. Notice I'm once again using square brackets around um, the two premises here just so that I can kind of separate it and not get confused with the number of prem uh, parentheses that I have in what I've written. That's all those are. Those square brackets mean the same thing as parentheses. We just use them in math when we have too many parentheses and we want to, you know, be very clear about what matches with what. Okay, so once we have the argument in symbolic form um, as, an, as a one singular if-then statement, we can construct a truth table for that statement. So here we get our truth table. Notice that I have filled in the PQ negation of P and negation of Q columns for us, but next we have the if-then statement right here. Um, well, we already got the negation column here, so then we can and them, and then we have our if-then completely. So that should generally be what it looks like, is you might need these four columns to start from, and then it'll just sort of build its way outward. So we'll have one for each premise, then the and statement, then the if-then statement. Um, so here, if P then Q, we know this one is just one of our basic um, one of our basic connectives. So the if P then Q is only false if we start true and end false. So we've got our one, our two, and we start true and end false, that's right here. Then we've got an and statement between this column and this column. So ands are only true if both are true, which happens in the, the final row. So we get the following. And then finally we have yet another if-then statement where this is where we start and this is where we end. And once again, it's only false if we start true and end false. So in this case, we didn't end false anywhere, right? Or we we didn't end false when we started true anywhere, um, so there's no time where that messes uh, where that um, that messes with us. So in other words, this is in fact all true. So since it is all true, this is actually an implication. 
It is a tautology, right? From our previous chapter, we learned those words. Um, when we have an implication in our argument, that means that the premises imply the conclusion. This is a valid argument. This works. If any of those were false, if even just one of them ends up being false, you do not have a valid argument. You have an invalid argument because a valid argument has to be true no matter what. It has to not matter whether or not the statements you made are lies. It just it works out logically that no matter what, this is the the argument is valid. In ma no matter what, the conclusion is implied. Again, a valid argument does not need to be in itself accurate. That's a whole nother thing that's um, called soundness, which we're not really going to get into in this class. But um, the point is, is that we only need to show that every th that no matter what our incoming statements were, true or false doesn't matter, the argument always works out regardless of the facts being given. So this one is another one with a special name. This is the law of contraposition. Now it sort of makes sense that that would be its name because it is sort of taking the contrapositive, right? Remember that the contrapositive is um, negation of Q, then negation of P, right? And so if we start with if P then Q, P, Q, right? That's our original. Now negation of Q and negation of P right there, that's the contrapositive, right? Um, these have other names, sometimes the law of detachment, again modus ponens, is called um, affirming the conclusion, or sorry, affirming the hypothesis because we have affirmed the first statement which is sometimes called the hypothesis um, in order to get the conclusion. And the law of contraposition is sometimes called denying the conclusion. We deny the conclusion in order to deny the hypothesis. But you don't need to necessarily memorize all these names. You just need to memorize, you just need to know the argument forms. Know the symbols here and how they work. Do you need to know the actual name of what it is? Not necessarily. Okay. So let's see examples of the next two valid argument forms. So we've seen examples of the law of de detachment and the law of contraposition. This law of syllogism, we have if P then Q, if Q then R, therefore if P then R. So if one thing implies the next and that implies a third thing, then the first implies the third. So for example, here we have if it is July, then it is summer. If it is summer, then I can go to the beach. Therefore, if it is July, I can go to the beach. So my P was, it's July, my Q is, it's summer, my R is, I can go to the beach, and this makes sense. July gives me summer, summer gives me beach, so July gives me beach. We just sort of skipped the middle part, right? And think of it as we're going P, Q, R, and then we just skip over Q to get directly from P to R. That's the law of syllogism. Next we have the disjunctive syllogism. So remember a disjunction is an or statement. So this one includes an or statement. So we have P or Q, negation of P, therefore Q. Okay, so again, what we're doing here is we're essentially saying, if it's not one, then it has to be the other. So we are not, uh, we are going to get either burgers or pizza. We did not get burgers, therefore we got pizza. It has, if it's not one, then it's the other. If it has to be one of these two things and it's not one of them, then it's the other one. That's what the disjunctive syllogism gives us. Now these are standard valid arguments. All of these make sense and no matter what the statements coming into them are, they are valid. But there are also standard invalid arguments. These are standard fallacies, which is a weird thing to say, but what I mean by this is that they are common. Like, you never want to make an invalid argument, but these two are the most common types of invalid arguments that show up. There are plenty of other invalid arguments that show up, but these are the ones that are most common. So this is the fallacy of the converse and the fallacy of the inverse. Again, just like the law of the contraposition came from the name of the contrapositive, being negation of Q goes to negation of P, the fallacy of the converse is 
we get uh, our if p then q, we, we also get our second premise being q, and that's supposed to give us p. That's the converse, right? And we know the converse is not the same thing as the original. Similarly, the fallacy of the inverse, remember that the inverse is negation of p, implies a uh, negation of q, and we know that's also not the same thing as the original, right? So we have our second premise being negation of p, our conclusion negation of q, these are invalid arguments. So think, for example, if you are swimming, then you are in water. For the fallacy of the converse, we say, okay, you're in water, and conclude, therefore, you must be swimming. For the fallacy of the inverse, we say, you're not swimming, and conclude, therefore, you must not be in water. Well, this is invalid, because what if you're taking a bath? Both of these things, both of these original statements would be accurate, right? But the conclusions wouldn't. So that we can't necessarily draw that conclusion. It is possible that you are swimming, or you're not in water, or whatever. It's possible, but it's not about whether or not it's possibly true. It's about whether or not it is necessarily 100% has to be true based on the premises given. And in fact, this doesn't have to be true. There are other options. That's where fallacies come in, is when there is another possibility. Because anytime we make an argument in logic, we want it to we want our conclusion to necessarily follow, which means we want our conclusion to always have to be the only option. Um, because we don't like ambiguity. So, let's see if we can identify some common arguments. So determine whether the following argument is valid or invalid based on our knowledge of the common arguments that I just listed. So here we have, if you're on Instagram, then you see my pictures. If you see my pictures, then you know I have a cat. Therefore, if you are in, on Instagram, then you know I have a cat. Okay, so here there's more ideas at play because we have being on Instagram is the first idea. Seeing my pictures is the second. We've got my pictures again, so that one's repeated. And then you know I have a cat. Okay, that's three ideas. Then we get Instagram, cat again. So we've got P, Q, and R. P is Instagram, Q is my pictures, R is I have a cat. So in this case, if P, then Q, if Q, then R, therefore, if P, then R is what we've got going on, right? So which rule does this go with? Well, this is the law of syllogism. So by the law of syllogism, this is valid. We don't have to go through making the argument structure where I put the two premises together and make the if-then statement and all of that. I don't have to do that. It would be entirely possible to go through this process if you don't remember your laws. We could write this out um, if we wanted to and then make the truth table and go through all of that, but we don't need to because we know the law of syllogism. So this is valid without needing to go through the truth table work. Next, we have, if it is a rose, then it smells sweet. It smells sweet, therefore it is a rose. Now just thinking about this, this feels wrong, right? Because plenty of things smell sweet that aren't roses, right? All we know is this is a sweet smelling thing. Does that mean it has to be a rose? No, of course not. But why? Why is this why doesn't this make sense? Well, let's write it out symbolically. So our two ideas at play are it being a rose and it smelling sweet. So P is it is a rose, Q is it smells sweet. So we have if P then Q. Our second premise is simply Q, and our conclusion is simply P. So which type of fallacy is this? Well, it's the fallacy where we go from Q to P. What is that called? Q to P is the converse. So this is the fallacy of the converse. And therefore, it is invalid. It is a fallacy. Here we have, I've now changed it to, it is not a rose, and therefore it does not smell sweet. So same P, Q, same if P, then Q, but now this is the negation of P. 
and we're concluding the negation of q. Once again, if we think this out, it makes it it would make sense to say that this would have to be a fallacy because plenty of things smell sweet that aren't roses, right? But what type of fallacy is this? You need to be specific. So, once again, once we write it out, negation of p to negation of q, what is this called? Well, negation of p implying the negation of q, that is the inverse. So this is the fallacy of the inverse. And therefore, it is invalid. Now, we've seen only arguments that had two premises, right? Arguments can have as many premises as we want. We can have a hundred things put together before we get to a conclusion. The basic argument forms tend to only have the two premises, but they can be put together and they can build on each other and all of that, and we can get a lot more complicated if we wanted to. In this case, I'm just going to show us a three premise argument because we're not going to get that complicated in this class, but it's entirely possible. So, we're going to use a truth table instead because it can't be one of our basic um, one of our basic arguments here. But we can always make a truth table of any um, type of argument we make. So, here we have if my cell phone company is Verizon, then I can call you free of charge. I can call you free of charge, or I can send you a text message. I can send you a text message, or my cell phone company is Verizon. Therefore, my cell phone company is Verizon. So there's a lot more going on in here, and it's a bit harder to put together whether or not this makes sense, right? Our previous arguments, we kind of could think them out to say whether or not they made sense. But this one, there's more happening, so it might be more difficult to logic this out in our heads. So putting it in symbolic form is really the only way to go. So what are our um, ideas at play? What are our simple statements? We have um, my cell phone is Verizon, uh, I can call you, and I can send a text. That's the three ideas here that are getting repeated in various ways. So that'll be my P, Q, and R. So then my first statement is We've got P, then Q right there. My second statement is I can call you free of charge, so that is Q, or I can send you a text, which is R, then I can send you a text, R, or my cell phone company is Verizon, uh, P, and therefore my cell phone company is Verizon, which is just straight up P. So all that together is no negations or anything like that. So we want to make an argument from this. Our argument is going to be taking each of these and putting them together with an and between them, right? Put parentheses, 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 ands between them, and then all of that, therefore, the conclusion, like so. So all of that together, therefore, P. So we're going to make a very large truth table for this one. Um, so that truth table is going to look like the following. We've got P, Q, R, we, which means we end up with eight rows because we've got the three simple statements. Um, so there's a lot going on here. We're going to need um, if P then Q, Q or R, and R or P. We need each of these to start building up our AND statements. But um, we, bringing it down to its most basic forms, these are all um, statements we know how to work with. So first, we remember that if P then Q is uh, only false if it starts true and ends false. So where does it start true? Where does it end false? So it's going to be false here and here. Everything else is true. Uh, Q or R is only false if both are false. So we look for where are they false. So both are false here and here. Then R or P only false if both are false once again. So we look to the P falses um, and we get false, false, like so. Now we are conjuncting first uh, one and two, 
and our conjunctions are and statements are only true if both are true. So we've got both true, both true, both true, both true, both true. So we've got three, four, five rows where they are um, both true. So that's going to give us our trues. Everything else is false. Next, we are conjuncting once again. So we haven't seen before a situation where I'm just doing uh, conjunction followed by another conjunction, an and and then another and. But we can do this in any order we want. So we've already taken care of this one in this column. So now I just tack on another one. We can also think of it as it's only true when all three are true. Like if you want to do them all together, you could do that as well. So the point is, is when are all three of these statements true? That's going to be here, 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 and here. But you can also think of it as when is this and this true, which is here, 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 and here. See that it's the same thing because these are uh, this column is only true when these two are already both true. So it's just however you want to simplify it for yourself. So in other words, we get four trues and uh, four falses. And then finally, we have our if then statement. So our if then statement, we're starting here and ending at just plain P. And remember, if then is only false if we start true. So here's where we start true and end false. So we end false here. Where do they line up? They line up here and here. So there are two um, places where we are ending false. And so the question is, is this valid or invalid? Well, as soon as there are falses present, this is an invalid argument. It doesn't matter that the majority of this is true. If there is any case where this wouldn't be true, if there is any possibility that this is not true, uh, that this is not all true at the end, then it is an invalid argument because that's the point is we need it to necessarily be true no matter what. So in this case, it is not unless it is invalid. All right, so now let's talk about drawing our own conclusions. We now understand these argument forms. So I want us to be able to write out our own conclusions given a set of premises. So we can use those common arguments to make valid conclusions for ourselves. So here I have premise one is, I will either attend the concert or the volleyball game. Premise two is, I did not attend the concert. What would my conclusion be? So we can start by building out the symbolic argument. You might be able to figure this out without doing it symbolically, but we're going to be thorough about this. So first, my ideas at play are going to a concert and going to a volleyball game, so that'll be P and Q. So then together, my premises are P or Q and then negation of P. So what is my conclusion? Well, I want to think back to my argument forms. I'm going to see that this is the premises for the disjunctive syllogism. Disjunctive syllogism means that I can conclude Q validly. And what is Q? Q is I will attend the volleyball game. So my conclusion is I attended the volleyball game. And so we can do this with any given argument. And we can also see that sometimes you won't be given enough premises to make a valid conclusion. If, for example, you were told, um, you know, if it is cold, then it is snowing. Um, oh, other way around. If you were told, if it is snowing, then it is cold, and then you're told, um, it's uh, not cold, you can't conclude anything from that, right? That is the beginning of a fallacy, but if you just say, no, I refuse to make a conclusion, well, then you've avoided making any fallacious arguments. That's what we want to do in real life here is think those out and say, no, I'm not going to come to a conclusion because there are multiple possibilities. That's the point of understanding these argument forms is to really see in real life how we can avoid making false conclusions um, by avoiding fallacies.